April the 14th, 2019, I gave you a quote from B.B. McKinney. The quote says, have faith in God. When your pathway is lonely, he sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children have faith, have faith in God. Have faith in God, he's on the throne. Have faith in God, he watches over his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith, have faith in God. As never before, we must put our faith in the God of the Bible. I mentioned these current events and things because these things are real. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And these things affect people's psyche. They affect people's minds. Because the truth is, the people don't know what to think. On one hand, U.S. citizens have been threatened their livelihood unless they uh, conform and take the shot. Uh, that's on one hand. On the other hand, they're keeping the borders, southern border open, so that hundreds of thousands can come in and we don't know anything about their vaccination status at all. A person with just a modicum of their brain functioning knows that there's something terribly inconsistent about that. How are you going to fire U.S. citizens? Businesses are already struggling to get workers because the government is paying people not to work. We got cargo ships, 60, almost 70 of them off the coast of California loaded there's not enough workers to unload the ships. I heard a good suggestion the other day. Someone said, well, we have workers. I said, they're in prison. Go get them. Amen. That's good chain game. Get them. Because prison don't mean you get to sit in the cell all day and do nothing. And pay them you know, a little something. Say, unload them, unload them ships. And let's get this economy going again. Or, better than that, stop paying people to stay home. I want to say this to your upper room and those who are watching me. If I have any influence with you, take this advice. It will, you will love me for it in the long run. You will be better off if you get up and go to work every day and you make less than you will be if you stay home and let them give you more. They're working on your mind. They are conditioning you. They're conditioning you to, to be all right with something for nothing. Don't you let them screw your mind like that. Because sooner or later, sooner or later, see, Margaret Thatcher said it, the problem with socialism is that sooner or later you run out of other people's money. Sooner or later you're gonna have to go to work. You have to make it for yourself. I'm not for a society where everything is free. Free college, free daycare, free this, free that, free health care. Let's see, free, everything free. You know who wasn't for that? God. The first thing God gave Adam was a job. 
Now, that was priority number one with God. And, and God didn't hire him part-time either. First job, day one. Uh, what time, when do I get off? The Lord looked at him and said, uh, six days thou shalt work. That's what God said. And uh, uh, he worked all day. Well, how many days do I get off? Hey, listen, eight or seven days in a week. Six of them you're working. And on the Sabbath day, you rest. Some of you could, you would never be a good employee for God. You don't have the stamina. You can't cut it. You can't pull it. You think you can. God, when God sends you to work, Paul worked so hard one day, Paul said, I'm all, I'm, I'm, I'm now ready to be offered. He likened himself to a drink offering. He said, I'm all poured out. Praise the Lord. God says you got to work. Now, uh, uh, the, the powers that be, I don't want to be too political so you all will say amen. They're paying you not to work. They want to cripple you. Work gives you dignity. Yeah. Hmm. Woo. The, the dignity of work. The dignity of earning your own paycheck. The dignity of of, of uh, 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 being employed somewhere. The dignity of running your own business. See, when you earn your own keep, you can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. You, you may make more or make less, but whatever you make, you're earning it. And there is dignity and self-respect in that. See, when, you, when, when a man works, let me just talk to the men. When a man goes to work, at the end of the day when he comes home and he's tired, he don't, he don't feel bad about being tired because he's got a right to be tired because he's been working all day. You don't feel right tired if you hadn't been working. And your woman, your wife don't look at you right either. What you tired for? She might not tell you to your face, but that's what she's thinking. Look at him sitting there in the chair. Those are, and he's been there all day. She want to grab the pan. She want to grab the pot. The pan is a boom. Wake up. Yeah, you got to, work gives you dignity where you got a right to go to sleep. And then it gives you a reason to get up the next morning. I got somewhere to go. Now I want to say to my friends who are watching, be careful with retirement. When you retire, you're going to enjoy going fishing or whatever it is you'd like to do for the first two weeks. You're going to enjoy doing nothing maybe for a few weeks. But the way the human body, the human being is made, the human being needs something to do. Needs somewhere to go. Amen. The only reason a parent, an island par paradise is enjoyable is as long as you know there is hustle and bustle and hard work to get back to when you go back home. If that becomes your life for the rest of your life, you'll grow to hate that island. You'll hate them palm trees. You're going to get sick and tired of coconuts. You're tired of beach. You're tired of the sand. You're tired of nothing. Oh, the, 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 the noise of the waves will drive you crazy. And you get you end up drowning yourself trying to get off that island because you need to get back to work. Amen. Amen. So they're trying to train you. They're, they're training us. Am I right? They're trying to train us. Amen. Not to work. I, I was talking to Deacon Morgan. Pray for him. Deacon Morgan last week lost... Uh, um, one of his brothers. And um, Deacon Morgan is just a tremendous man of God. And I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't be here were it not uh, for him. And uh, he's here today. Stand up, Deacon. There, there he is. He's, but he's, you know, he's cut from a different cloth. 
came from a different day. So my brother passed, and when I came to work, um, Deacon, was it Thursday? It was Friday. I was up here, and we were coming to do my work, and lo and behold, he's out there working. I said, Deacon, what are you, what are you doing here? You just lost your brother. He said, Pastor, I, I do better working. So my brother was saved. His spirit is with Jesus. His body is in the hands of the mortician. I want to prepare these boxes and buy these turkeys and get this work done to help poor people. So I do better working. I said, Dick, you come from a different generation and a different day. You thank God you were born when you was. Because we live in a day now where, oh, it's going to take six months before he's able to get back. You see, there is a dignity to working. Yes. Amen. I was talking to, from one, you're talking one generation to the next. I enjoyed something that, that Brother Joshua said that stuck in my spirit. He's a very enterprising young man. And he's... Uh, uh, he's an investor, and he told me that someone, we were talking to someone, they asked him for some tips, and he, he led with this. I thought it was brilliant. He said, I can, I'll, I'll give you whatever uh, uh, information that I can, but I just, I just want you to know that God gives all of us the same 24 hours in a day. Now, it's what you do with your 24 is going to determine how far you go. It ain't like God gave me, gives me 25 and gave you uh, 19. He gave us all the same 24. What are you doing with your 24? That's a good starting point, isn't it? What are you doing with your time? We need to have faith in God. Some of you all like it when I talk like this, and then some of you want to leave so bad. But don't leave. I'm right. Don't let them cripple you by making you lazy. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And they and the only folk, the only folk who is buying this stuff uh, in many cases is us. Now them Hispanics work. They're opening up credit unions, banks, and they're growing. The Latino com uh, community in America today is 62 million strong in this country. Good for them. It makes up, they make up now 19% of the U.S. population. Phew, they shot past us. African Americans make up, we are 43 million, 43 to 44 million strong. We only make up 13% of the population. Two major differences between the two people. Difference number one is that most Hispanics, Latinos, are Catholic. And Catholicism teach, you got to pray for this new pope, uh, preach and teach that abortion is sin. So they have their babies. Most African Americans are Protestants. And I guess the Protestant church stopped preaching against abortion. Because we lead the nation in abortions, even though we're only 13% of the population. And of that 13%, our women make up 8%. And of that 8%, the ovulating women make up 3%. So how in the world can 3% be responsible for almost 40% of the nation's abortions. Somebody says it's embarrassing. You're right. We deserve better. That, that's, that's one of the things that, why they, went, they surpassed us. And then the, another reason is that in the Latino community, you can be a Democrat or a Republican and still be recognized as a member of the community. 
Black community, if you're not a Democrat, you're nothing. That's the problem. See, thank you. Thank you, Sister Jacobs. That's the problem. We ought to be able, like anyone else, to be to choose Democrat, Republican, or like me, independent, and not feel obligated to vote for anyone whose policies we do not agree with. Well, you just got to go along. I don't have to go along with any of them. And I don't. If I agree with the policy, they get my vote. If I don't, then they will never get my support. And to me, uh, the Democrats in Raleigh, I won't send this out. I don't know why I'm saying all this. They showed their true colors because I have never said to anybody running for office of any party, don't come by here. I've never said that. But what I have said is if you are for the killing of the unborn, there's no point in you coming. And uh, I guess they heard me. And I have not had a one Democrat who's running for office to come and visit. Now we got people, we got votes, but I didn't say no Democrat could come. I didn't say bring all the Republicans, send all the independents. I just said, if you're for kill the killing of the unborn, there's no, you ain't gonna, uh, you're not having words, number one. I don't, I don't, I, we don't do that with any of them. But you ain't gonna get no honorable mention. They, I'm, not, I'm not acknowledging people who shed innocent blood because I don't want to be partakers of their evil behavior. And, and since I'm the pastor, since I'm the bishop here, then I have that right. Say amen. amen. And uh, I haven't seen him since. Now what does that say? That doesn't say anything bad about me. That says something bad about them. Have faith in God. Let me move on. Um, in order to, y'all talking too much. In order to have faith in the Lord. You got to view the Lord a certain kind of way. First Peter chapter three, verse 13 through 15 speaks to this. It says, verse 13 says, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? That is, who is he that will harm you if you are zealous? if you zealously follow that which is good. And Peter asked this question in the same sense that Paul uh, asked uh, in Romans 8 and 31 when Paul says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Paul was saying, since God is for us, then who can be against us? Well, here, praise the Lord, uh, Peter said, uh, if, you, if you are, a hard worker and you're zealously following that which is good uh, who could harm you but notice what he does in verse 14 he says but and if you suffer for righteousness sake he didn't say get depressed he says happy are ye and now listen uh, upper room and uh, our friends online and be not afraid of their terror that is, do not be afraid of their threats. We live in a day now where discussion is no longer allowed. We used to be able to discuss science. We used to be able to discuss whether or not global warming uh, is man-made or not. We used to be able to discuss, have a discussion on vaccines. But if you, if you, don't, if you don't go along with the prevailing view, you get silenced. You get canceled. 
all of a sudden they say uh, what you're peddling is disinformation or misinformation, but uh, uh, we don't know who, who determines whether it's misinformation or not. So there's a lot of threats that are taking place. They're threatening people, threatening people's jobs, threatening people's livelihoods. Oh, the NBA, those players are going through. Those players are going through. Some of them, their spirits are being broken. And then the way uh, they're attacking uh, Kyrie Irving. Now, it is Kyrie's body. You know, it, it is amazing the same people, the same people who will tell you, you can't tell a woman what to do with her own body when it comes to abortion. And by the way, those of us who are against abortion, we're not trying to tell you what to do with your body. We're talking about that baby in your body. We're not talking about your body. We're talking about the baby in your body. Amen. That baby is a human being. What else can a woman be pregnant with? Raise your hand. Come and tell me. Come, I'll give you the mic. What else can a woman be pregnant with other than a human being? You can't have a crocodile. You can't have an alligator. You can't give birth to a cat or a dog. No, that's, that won't happen. Am I right? Oh, this is tight today. This is tight today. This upper room is being stingy on me. And so, but I, I'll try, I'm going to try to swim. Yes, we're, we're threatened. We're threatened. And he says, uh, uh, be not afraid of their threats. And look at this, neither be troubled. But here's what you do. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That is set apart Christ in your heart. In your heart, members of this church, friends who are watching, build an altar in your heart to the Lord. View Jesus Christ over and above everything and everyone else. Set apart, isn't just apart, but above all else. Anything that contradicts Christ, you, you go along with Christ. You let that thing go. Sanctify, sanctify the Lord in your heart. And not only to sanctify the Lord in your heart, but also, uh, and be ready always to give an answer, to give a defense to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If they don't ask you, be prepared just in case they do. If no one walks up to you and says, why do you believe what you believe? Then that, that's all right. But if they do, he says, be ready. And notice, he didn't say, be, just be, par- be prepared to tell them what you believe. But he says, be prepared to give the reason for what you believe. See, I believe a certain kind of way. I'm, I love to talk. I'm open to discuss anything with you. I have an opinion and I have positions on things but I can tell you why I believe what I believe. And my why may or may not change your mind. But always know your why may or may not change mine either. And if my why is rooted in the word of the Lord, then your why certainly won't change my mind because the Bible is right. So the the Christian lifestyle makes no sense, nor does uh, living by faith, nor does the Christian faith make sense until and unless we sanctify the Lord in our hearts. This is a waste of time if Jesus is not special to you. You don't get it. You can't understand it if in your heart 
Jesus is not king of kings, Lord of lords. See, it's how you see Jesus. I see Jesus as everything. He's the end all and be all. He's the purpose for all. We were created by him and for him. The Bible teaches that we were made for his pleasure. I told you last Sunday that Jesus is both the, the center and the circumference of the Bible. Jesus uh, is reality. He makes life worth living. Holy living is only possible as we sanctify the Lord in our hearts. Samuel Williams once said this about lordship. He said, lordship can be defined in four words. And the four words was admit, submit, commit, and transmit. Admit, submit, commit, and transmit. Admit our sin. Submit our lives to Christ. Commit ourselves to the Lord's ways and transmit, share the gospel with other people. That's how you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We get busy doing that, the Lord will bless us. And notice Peter says that we're to do this, and I'm gonna move on from this passage, but we're to do it even in the context of trouble. Because verse 14 says, but if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Do you see that? Happy are ye and be not afraid. We are told in the Bible 365 times, be not afraid. There's a be not afraid for every day of the year. 365 times we are told in scripture, Fear not, be not afraid, hallelujah. And so we're told here, even in the midst of trouble, admit, submit, commit, and transmit your ways to the Lord and the Lord will bless us. Isn't that wonderful? In other words, have faith in God. In our text, since y'all don't, too much like this talk today. Verse 12 says, on the morrow when they were come from Bethany. Now, uh, I want you to show, show them slide number one. You know, I got these slides. Amen. I, I just like for you to see it. The, the slides here, you see, there's Jerusalem, right? That's Bethany. Bethany is approximately two, one and a half miles from Jerusalem. Now, everything I'm telling you, you need to keep in mind. And you'll see it later on. All right, the next slide. Uh, and now, in verse one, we see where they were in Bethage, or Bethpage, as some pronounce it, Jerusalem and Bethany. They're right here in the same general location. You see that? Now look at verse one of chapter 11. It says, and when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethpage, uh, and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples. So our text tells us that uh, our Lord uh, had left Bethany going to Jerusalem. Bethany, oddly enough, means house of depression or house of misery. And according to verse 9 through 11, our text takes place the day after Palm Sunday, which places our text in the last week of our Lord's life. Four days after the event of our text, our Lord 
will be on the cross. So he's on his way to die. In chapter in verse uh, chapter 11 verse 9 says and they that went before and they that followed cried here it is hosanna blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord blessed be uh, the kingdom of our father david that cometh in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest and Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And notice this. And when he went into the temple, the crowds everywhere crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Our Lord goes into the temple. And notice this is an interesting footnote that Mark gives us. He says, and when he had looked round about upon all things, Jesus walks into the temple, surveys the entire temple complex. This is Jesus. Jesus walks into the temple. Are you following? Surveys the temple complex. And you know what he has to say about the temple? Nothing. The only thing that is said is, and now the evening tide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. He left and went back to Bethany. Now, it's certainly not a good thing if Jesus walked all the way through your house. If Jesus walked up in here today and walked all around the upper room and just everywhere and then, and then went out the front door and, and said nothing, I'd be scared to death because I'm trying to figure out now what did that mean? Did you like it? Are we on track? Am I, am I doing pretty good? What? Did I, am I missing, uh, have I missed altogether? You said nothing, Lord, except I'm going back to the hotel. And it, it's in carry. I wouldn't know how to take that. So our text shows us, here is our Lord leaving Bethany, the house of misery, by the way, Bethany was, uh, the home he was staying in was the home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. That, that would be something, wouldn't it? To have Jesus staying at your house. Jesus sleep there all night, get up the next day and go out and do ministry and then retire back at your home in the evening. See, he, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, they had a wonderful relationship. And so uh, here he is now on his way uh, back to uh, Jerusalem. Are you following me? Now, there's something I want to show you. So while walking the day after Palm Sunday, on this short trip, a strange incident takes place. It's strange, but it was prophesied almost 800 years ago. The Bible says on um, verse, verse 12 and on the morrow when they were come from Bethany he was hungry. Now why would Mark point that out? I mean Jesus was 100% uh, God. Am I right? And he was 100% man. He's the only God man to ever walk the earth. So he's 100% divine as well as 100% human. Is there anything unusual about a, a human being hungry? Most humans in here are hungry all the time. We love to eat. <laughs> so Jesus was hungry. Why would you point that out? Micah, in Micah chapter 7 and verse 1 uh, says, Woe is me, for I am as when they had gathered the summer fruits, as the grape gleanings of the vintage. 
There is no cluster to eat. My soul, look at this, desired the first ripe fruit. That is, my soul desired the early fig. Michael, Micah prophesies that a day would come when the Messiah would see a fig tree and would walk up to it and on this particular day, the Messiah would be hungry, desiring food from this fig tree and he would not be fed. Almost 800 years later, here it is. The day after Palm Sunday, our Lord sees this tree and he walks up to it and uh, uh, you got to bear with me today because the teacher, you know, it happens to me a lot. The teacher in me competes with the preacher. I want to take off preaching hard and hollering, but I want to teach this. Now, the good thing is you really got a good shout in earlier, earlier. So I, I was thinking for a minute, I might have to get up and introduce myself. Because these folks are just getting down. <laughs> Poor everybody shouting and dancing. So I said, dance on. <laughs> so now, I don't want you to dance so well that you have danced all your energy out. And then I don't want to look around now and see one of those who are doing all that shouting. If I do, I'm gonna tell them to wake you up. Say, get, wake, wake up. Don't <laughs> sleep on me. <laughs> now I want you to see how this is constructed. And you may, maybe this is more for the eight o'clock class, but I don't know. Look, but notice how it's written. It says, and seeing the fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply, he might find, Brother Tom, he might find anything thereon. I need you to underline anything. And he came to it, and when he came to it, see in the Bible, you got to pay attention to every word, he found nothing but leaves. Semicolon. Mark says, I got something else to tell you. For the time of figs was not yet. So Jesus goes looking to find something on the tree. Now, what we say, Mother Roberts, is that Jesus went to the fig tree looking for figs. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he went to the tree looking for something or anything. Look at it. Look, 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 look. Look, don't, don't. Look, praise the Lord. And, and you know what I did? I did something for you. Uh, this particular uh, incident is also recorded in Matthew's gospel. Uh, chapter number 21 and verse 19. And Matthew says the same thing. Verse 19, 18 and 19 says, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, the city was Jerusalem, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. So Matthew and Mark agrees that Jesus found nothing, but they also agree that Jesus went to the tree looking not for figs, but for something. I like it when you get quiet like this. Amen. Now, here's what Jesus knew and the Jews of his time knew. 
uh, was that fig trees around Jerusalem usually leafed. They leaf out in March and April. Now we know that our text takes place in April. For April is the month of the Passover. In four days, Jesus will be dead. So we're in that time, all right? The fig trees leaf out in March and April, but the fig trees do not bear figs until June. Hence, Mark telling us for the time of figs was not yet. Are you following me? So the tree didn't have figs on it. Jesus being Jesus, being God, being a Jew, being, praise the Lord, very familiar with the horticulture of the times. Fig trees were quite common, they were everywhere. Uh, and being the maker of all the seasons, he knew that it wasn't June. And uh, praise the Lord, he knew that the figs were, were not going to show up until June. So what, what's going on here? See, the, the, the problem was not that there were no figs. The problem, however, is that our Lord found nothing on the trees but leaves. That's the problem. See? And that he found nothing when there should have been something. I want to know for the time that the Lord has invested in you, what has he found? For the time. What, how, 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 what are you yielding? For the time. For the years you've been on this earth. For the mercy that he's shown all of us. What is he getting? What kind of return is the Lord getting? See, leaves are wonderful, but leaves are a poor substitute for something edible. Now leaves are wonderful if all you're looking for is shade. But if you're looking for something to eat, you, and uh, unless the leaves are edible, you don't want leaves. Jesus wasn't looking for shade. The text tells us that he was hungry. He was looking for something to eat and he found nothing but leaves. Again, the Bible never said that he was looking for figs. The Bible says he was looking for something or anything. The truth is, the tree gave our Lord nothing to work with. He gave our Lord nothing to eat. Even though there was something edible that should have been present at the time when the tree was full leaf. I thought you said the time of figs was until June. And I know Mark said that the time of figs were not. I didn't say figs should have been there. I said something. Can, can you hear? I said something. And notice our Lord went looking for something. The text never said that he went looking for leaves. So I got to drive this home. And look at me, I'm using all these pregnant pauses to get you on the edge of your seat. But what, but what was he looking for then? I mean, preach it was a fig tree. So if you go to a fig tree, I mean, he wasn't expecting an apple. 
No, because it wasn't an apple tree. He wasn't, he wasn't expecting grapes. No, because it was not a grape vine. But he was expecting something that should have been present if the tree was full leaf. What what should he have expected? I tell you what, I think I can show you better than I can tell you. Uh, get slide number two. I want to show you what the Lord uh, was 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 looking for. Do you see that? Look, look at this. When the fig tree in March and April is full leaf. What also accompanies the full leaf fig tree are edible buds. Not figs, buds. So the Lord went looking for something. Buds. Something that he could work with. And something that should have been present, thank you so much, that was not. See, the Lord wasn't crazy and the Lord is not so cruel to curse a tree for doing what it was supposed to do. If you were full-leafed, then there should have been edible buds. So what the Lord found was nothing. Do you have edible buds? What, 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 what? Missionaries, elders, ministers, position holders, men, women, you're full-leafed. You know, you're flashing like you got it. You've been saved long enough to have it. What are you giving God when trouble comes? What are you giving God to work with when things go wrong? What are you giving God to work with on your job? What are you giving God? I'm speaking to the mature full leaf. Even if, even if you, you, you're not able to give him figs, you ought to be able by now to give him something. I wish I had a praying church. So because those edible buds was missing when they should have been present, the Lord said to the fig tree, ain't nobody eating from you forever. And then Mark gives us another, oh, another, praise the Lord, interesting tidbit. He says this, and I'm headed somewhere, and his disciples heard it. They heard him curse the fig tree. Now when he cursed the fig tree, no leaf fell. When he cursed the fig tree, the tree didn't buckle. The tree stood there seemingly impervious. Seemed as though nothing happened when he spoke to that fig tree. Which, by the way, was the only miracle of destruction recorded during our, our Lord's earthly ministry. All of his other miracles were miracles that healed people. He gave sight to the blind. Amen. He let the lame man walk and the dumb man talk. He healed the leper, but this time he cursed the fig tree. I'm just, I, I just thank him that he didn't curse the human, but he cursed a tree. But he didn't stand there all day cursing the tree. You're cursed, you're cursed, you're cursed. You are cursed, you're cursed, curse, curse. You are cursed, you're cursed, curse, curse, curse. Curse, curse, you're cursed up and down, you're cursed. Yay! You're cursed. No, Jesus said, ain't nobody eating from you no more. You're cursed and walked away. The disciples looking, well, didn't look, don't look, it's cursed to me. 
Look like the same old fig tree to me. I don't see any changes in the situation. Jesus walks away. He walks away from a barren fig tree. Now remember, I told you in uh, verse uh, 11 that he had already surveyed the temple the day before. Now he's going right back to the same temple that he just surveyed. So he leaves a barren fig tree to only go to a barren temple. Are you following me? He leaves that tree. Oh my, the tree uh, was fully leafed. The tree should have had something, but it didn't. And so now the Lord goes, and you know, he didn't get what he wanted from the tree. See, the tree had style over substance. The tree looked like it was what it was not. The tree looked strong, but it wasn't. The tree looked like it had it going on, but it didn't. You know, uh, preachers, don't ever let eloquence of preaching be a substitute for substance. Some people can, can say nothing well. But what the Lord is interested in is substance. So Jesus cursed the tree, not for a lack of fruit, but for pretense. For the pretense of its leaves. Those buds should have been there. So now he walks into the temple. Are you following me? Oh, here's the preacher, here's the teacher. I know y'all tired of him. We want the preacher to come. But here's the teacher. I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Mark, Matthew, and Luke places our Lord's entering into the temple in the last week of our Lord's sojourn, earthly sojourn before the cross. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agrees that this took place the day after Palm Sunday. Amen. You, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can look it up uh, and, and, and study it for yourself. In Matthew is chapter 21 and Luke is chapter 19. And of course here in Mark is chapter 11. The synoptics places this in the last week of our Lord's life. But then here comes John, the beloved disciple. John doesn't place this in the last week of our Lord's life. And John doesn't teach that our Lord left Bethany. Uh, show that last slide. Uh, but John teaches that our Lord uh, left, not little Bethany, but John teaches that our Lord left Capernaum to come down to Jerusalem. Capernaum. So if you look at, thank you, if you look at John chapter two, in verse 12 it says, and it says, after this he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples and they continued there not many days and the Jews Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting and when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen and, and, and poured out uh, the changers money and overthrew the tables and said to them that sold doves, take these things hence and make not my father's house 
a house of merchandise. So now John says, I just showed you, that he left Capernaum and made a 80 mile trek. It took four days for him to walk from Capernaum to Jerusalem. We just read where Mark said that Jesus left Bethany. One and a half miles, I just showed you, between Jerusalem and Bethany. So now, what is the solution to the, the dilemma? Uh, it's not a dilemma at all. i tell you what happened. Instead of there being one cleansing of the temple, that was two. The first time John records when Jesus goes in, this is right after his first miracle. After the miracle of the marriage feast of Cana, he goes in and cleanses the temple. Three years later, on his way to the cross, coming from Bethany, he goes right back into the temple. And guess what he finds three years later? The temple is full-leafed. But the temple has no buds. The temple for all of the miracles that Jesus had performed from the first week of his earthly ministry to three years later on his way to the cross, the temple was still doing the same thing. I wonder where, what kind of progress we've made over the last three years. I tell you one thing you learn in this, you won't say amen, but Jesus doesn't, he certainly doesn't change. When he saw that mess three years prior, he turned over the table. When he saw that mess, three years later, he turned over the table. So that goes to show what God said was sin yesterday is sin today. Oh, some of us, we've, we've caved, we've caved, but Jesus don't cave. If it was wrong then, it's wrong now. If it was right then, it's right now. Three years later, he walks in to the temple. When he walks into the temple, uh, he, soon as he got to the temple area, the first thing that met him was the stench and the smell of animals in the temple. See, because when, when they brought the animals into the outer court, animals are animals. Animals smell like animals. Animals do like animals. The animals were defecating, relieving themselves. Flies, gnats, everything right there in the outer court, in the court of the Gentiles, which was an official part of the house of God. Not only, now you know good and well, that stench shouldn't have been in God's house. And think about the stench that we have in the church world today. The stench that we have in our conventions. All these sissies and homosexuals and oh, fornicators and adulterers, everybody carrying on in the house of God. It stinks to high heaven. And God have given us more than enough time, I can't get a witness, to clean up the house. God's given us more, it'll get better, more than enough time to get right with God. Jesus coming around three years later and uh, the first thing he catches is a whiff of those animals. And then his uh, ears, his sense of hearing gets involved because he hears the clean of the money changers. That hadn't even changed. He remembered three years ago, he turned the tables over. Them wicked folks set the tables back up. 
and went on about themselves with business as usual, changing, exchanging the money. See, when the pilgrims would come in from everywhere, uh, the Jews, to the temple, for convenience, somebody came up with an idea. Instead of you leaving your home and getting your own animal, your own sacrifice, and bringing it to the temple and offering it to the Lord, somebody came up with an idea. Said, what we would do is we'll keep them at the temple. We'll have them when you come and you can buy them from us. See, see, it was a good idea, but it wasn't a God idea because it ruined the temple. Look at how we're bringing secular things into the church. Churches now look like clubs. Churches now look like clubs and rock and roll sound stages. Well, y'all don't like what I'm saying. All these lights and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, I, I, listen, I don't want to get to where I need too much artificial help to hold your attention when I'm preaching. Some of these preachers have admitted to everybody they can't preach because they need everything, jumbo this, jumbo that, all kind of cartoons and everything going on behind them to hold their attention. These things are distractions. You need to hear the word of God. You need to hear the word of God preach with power and authority and you need to discipline yourself while the word is being preached to listen. Listen when it's being preached. Praise the Lord. Listen while it's being preached because God is saying something to you. He's saying something. Jesus looks and they are turning over the, uh, the, the, the money changers and you're talking about a, a sham, a con, See, the money had to be uh, trans, had to be changed from Roman currency to Tyrian currency, for that was the currency of the temple tax. So, for the money changers to change the money, they were charging people exuberant prices to change the money over. So, folk were getting robbed in the temple. You had uh, smelly animals in the temple. They had gone from, the t they have taken the temple from being a place for praying, P-R-A-Y-I-N-G, and it went to, uh, and it had become a place for praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. Praying and paying. They were taking advantage of people in every way right there in the house of God. They set up a religious market in the house of God, in the court of the Gentiles. And uh, if there should have been anywhere where the Jews should have been witnessing, if there was anywhere where the Jews should have been evangelizing and sharing the faith of the gospel, it should have been in the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles didn't know God. The Gentiles wasn't saved, but instead of trying to win the Gentiles, they were trying to make that paper and get that money. And in many of our conventions today, we're not trying to win lost souls. We're trying to make a profit. We're not trying to touch the people. We're trying to make a dollar. We're not trying to, praise the Lord, save the lost. We're trying to take advantage of the lost. We gotta be careful that we do not do what they did in the court of the Gentiles. Jesus walked in and said, you've had plenty of time to get this stuff right, so he overturned the tables. Good God Almighty, instead of finding, praise the Lord, something in the temple that he could work with. The temple was just like the fig tree, which was a type for the nation of Israel. And the temple was a type for the religious condition of the people. And neither gave God anything that he could work with. And so Jesus began to turn over the tables. Are you praying for me? And uh, he said, I'm not having this in my house. 
And then he told them, not only are you not going to have this, now I'm going to really make you mad. Well, really, I'm, I, since, since I'm just preaching to myself today, uh, let, me, let, me, let me fix it where you really won't say amen. Not only did he uh, turn over the tables, but he said in verse 16, and would not suffer any man to carry any vessel through the temple. Jesus said, I'm sick and tired of you cutting through the temple, going through the temple as a shortcut. There's nothing sacred about making a shortcut through the house of God. My, the, the employees who work here, they know. Don't get caught. I don't care if you work on this side of the building or that side. But if you got to go from one side to the other, we have a hallway. Don't take a shortcut through the, through the sanctuary. Not to get you fired. Because this is too sacred for shortcuts. This ain't, this is, amen, whack on the shoes, walk around, get some exercise. But this is not, it's, it's to be treated a certain kind of way. That's why whenever I sat down with the architect to design this sanctuary, when we designed this sanctuary, I've told you before, what was popular at the time everywhere else was churches building what they call gymnatoriums. That is multi-purpose sanctuaries. You could, you could flip it from being a sanctuary to a basketball court, from being a sanctuary to a daycare center, from being a sanctuary to a family life center. When God told me to build this church, God said, take the sanctuary and make it holy. Set it apart where you can't do anything in the sanctuary but have church. Look at the floor, it's too uneven for basketball. Look at it, you can't play, you can't play soccer in here. And you know you can't set up no daycare in here. Little children running around all day long, uh, spilling milk, praise the Lord, changing diapers, trying to have class in the sanctuary. And then at night you're gonna flip it over and expect to have an atmosphere conducive for worship. The devil is a liar. The sanctuary is supposed to be set apart. And it may not matter to you today, but it will if you get cancer. It may not matter to you today, but it will if you need to be in some place where you could get prayer. David could go any place he wanted to go. But I heard David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. And this is in Psalms 27. He said, and that will I seek after, to, to dwell in the temple of the Lord and to behold the beauty of the Lord. And he says, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David said, I know I can pray anywhere I want to pray, but it's something about being in the house of God. I know, hallelujah, that God is everywhere, but there's something about being in the sanctuary. My, my, there are times when I'm up here and no one is here and I can walk in here and just sit on one of the pews. Nobody but me. And I feel the power of God. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because this area have been sanctified. Jesus said, this is not a shortcut. Y'all done, done made a path through the temple. Said, cut that mess out. And so the scribes, the muckety mucks, the priests, the leadership, of the, of the synagogue, of the temple got mad because they were liberal and they had allowed all this mess. And that's what's wrong with us now. We're allowing too much mess. The masons are in. Uh, uh, the fraternities, the sororities, everything's in the church. Uh, everything now but holiness. We're bringing everything in. The devil is a liar. Ah, uh, but some of these same folk who have brought everything else in, let me prophesy, the day will come when you're gonna need what you gave up. You closed your church and you didn't, you wouldn't let them open your church 
for the folk to come in and pray but you let them open your church to get tested for COVID you let them open the church to get the shot but you wouldn't let them open the church to come in and pray and I didn't I've never read what Jesus said my house shall be the house of shots for all men but then my house shall be the house of prayer for all nations and I found out that if you come in God's house I said I'm preaching what I used to preach I used to preach that if you come in God's house and call on the name of the Lord that God will answer prayer well here I am years later saying the same thing call on him from the house of God and he will he will hear and he will answer can I get a witness in the house of God Jesus after he turned over the tables shut down the shortcuts got rid of the money changers got those filthy beasts out of the temple he was walking he left there he left Jerusalem and he went back to Bethany knocked on Mary and Martha's door and Lazarus and said I'm back to spend the night but according to verse 27 the next day he left he was on his way back up to Jerusalem again and while on his way to Jerusalem they walked past that fig tree y'all hadn't forgot the tree had you and when he got to the fig tree Peter opened his mouth and said father he said Jesus look at this tree you cursed it yesterday, but look at it today. It's dried up from the roots. He was amazed because when Jesus first spoke to the tree, didn't anything happen? But the Lord had confidence in the power of God. Today, somebody is going to speak to the tree, even though you might not see anything. But if you believe and trust, God and just walk away and leave it in the hands of the Lord God will oh, the Lord will he'll fix it for him let me hear you say yeah won't he do it lift your hands and tell God thank you Peter said the tree is cursed from the root up it's dead and Jesus looked at them and said to them what I'm saying to you in the time of COVID in the time of critical race theory in the time of Black Lives Matter in the time of unrest in the time of the Klan in this time of hatred in this time of LGBTQ be confirmed in this time of great wickedness in this time of uncertainty I got a message for you have faith in God keep on believing if you keep on believing he will come through fire he told me when I prayed last week after Sunday I said God what do you want me to preach he said Patrick tell my people to have faith have faith have faith in God tell them that I'm still able able to heal able to keep able to deliver throw your hands and tell the Lord Lord I believe Lord I believe I put my trust in your power I put my trust in your word I put my trust in your ability yeah yeah somebody praise him right now 
70, let me close, 73 weeks and counting. And God is good. And when I look at my brother standing right back there, I said, look at God. He called me just a few weeks ago and said, brother, I got COVID. I don't know where I got it from. I want you to pray and tell the saints to pray for me. I told him, Tom, God's a healer. God's a way maker. He can still do it. Let's trust the Lord. He called me a few days later and said, brother, I got my report back and it's negative. I'm all right. God is. I can't get no help in here. The Lord is. He's able. He's real. Do you believe him today? If you believe, call on his name. Call him for what you want. Call on him. to your neighbor and say have faith have faith in God ah! Ah! have faith I'm, I'm not I'm not I didn't say have faith and I thank God for him I, I, I'm not mad at him I didn't say have faith I want to be clear uh, you know, I don't, I don't like to leave room for misunderstanding. I'm not saying have faith in the vaccine. I'm not saying have faith in not being vaccinated. What I'm saying is have faith in God. Yeah! Some people have faith in not going to the doctor. That's not faith in God. You got to know how to have faith in God. Every time I hear somebody say I'm safe because I've been fully vaccinated, you're not putting your faith in God. You're putting your faith in the vaccine and the media won't tell you and they might even drop me that might get a warning from Facebook but there's nothing that man makes that is foolproof can't nobody keep you but the Lord by the, the grace of God has brought us this far and God's grace will it'll lead us on when you have faith in God you won't be terrified when you have faith in God it'll put happiness in you Peter said happy are ye when you have faith in God you won't be troubled because you know that God's got your back God's got your back God has your head God has the rear God has what comes after you whatever it is God's got you. Have faith. Have faith. Have faith in God. That's what we used to preach pre-COVID. I'm glad that I'm still telling you, still saying to you the same thing that I said before China released it. Have faith in God. Other things are coming. Challenges lie ahead. But if Jesus is your anchor, I said if Jesus is your anchor, you'll be all right. Gotta wave your hand and say I'm gonna be all right. Gonna use your preaching voice and say, ah, oh, yeah, ah, oh, yes, I am, yes, I am, oh, Lord, praise your anchor, praise the anchor, he's the 
anchor of my soul. He's the keeper of my soul. Is he keeping you today? Is he keeping you today? Has he watched over you? Has he protected you in the night? Did he protect you on your way to church? Won't he keep you on your way home? He's the same yesterday, today and forever. So we may as well preach and tell the world he's got the power. He's able to do it. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Jesus, 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 Facebook, YouTube, Saints, Jesus is my anchor and he keeps my soul in him my steadfast while the billows roar. I am secure even when the wind blows. Jesus is my anchor and he keeps my soul top. Jesus is my anchor and he my soul in him I'm steadfast while the billows roar I am secure even when the wind blows Jesus is my anchor and he keeps my soul now my anchor holds in the storms of life while others fail beneath the strife when the heavy tide comes and my cable strain my anchor's firm and it shall remain when the breakers dash, you know the reef is near. But if Jesus is your anchor, you'll have no fear. He'll soon land us on heaven's shore. And the cares of life will be no more. Jesus, yes he is. In him, while the billow, I am secure. Even when the wind blows, he's my anchor. Let me say, Jesus is my anchor, and he keeps my soul in him. Somebody clap your hand. I am secure, even when the wind blows. He's my anchor, and he keeps my soul. Jesus is my anchor, and he keeps my soul. Go ahead.
your hands and worship right now. We're getting ready to pray. Glory to God. Father God, today, we put our faith in you. We put our faith in you in times like these. We put our faith in you in troublesome times. We will not be troubled. We're not in denial. Sickness is real. COVID is real. Oh, Lord. Things that's going on, they're real. But faith in you is real. And it's stronger than the devil. Ah, when Jesus spoke to the tree, he didn't see anything change right then and there. But he knew that God had heard his prayer. Oh Lord, if you know that the Lord have heard your prayer, then you ought to thank him right now. Then I heard him I heard him say something that the Holy Ghost just said. You, you got to put this in. He said, now, have faith in God. And if you just say to the mountain, be thou removed. Now, mountain, in the Jewish idiom, the, the hearers knew perfectly well that he was not talking about Mount Olivet. They knew perfectly well they were not talking about a literal mountain. He spoke of the mountain the same way Zerubbabel spoke of the mountain in the book of Zechariah chapter 4. There was problems facing Zerubbabel and the question was, O thou great mountain standing before Zerubbabel, you shall be made a stone. In the Hebrew idiom, mountain meant a difficult problem of significance that's hard to deal with. That's a mountain. So Jesus said, if you have mountains in your life, you can say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea. But now, now, here's where we go off the rails. See, anybody can say it. But you got to believe that those things which you say shall come to pass. See, you can't argue with your own deliverance now. See, because if you don't believe it, if you don't believe it, can't nobody believe it for you. You have to say to your mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And then it says, and shall not doubt in your heart. That's too much doubt. You got to rise. You, oh, hey, you rise or you die. You rise or the mountain gets the better of you. And shall not doubt in your heart, but believe that the things you say shall come to pass. He said, you shall have whatsoever you say. And by the way, to get this power, your heart has got to be right. When you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any. So you ain't gonna get the you you're not gonna get a healing mad with the world. Let it go. Still mad with daddy from 80 years ago. You gotta let it go. Let that go, let that go, let that go. Carrying grudges, you mad with some folk from the last church you left. Now you bring that over here. No, no, you gotta let that go because you want God to move on your behalf. You got to let some things go. Still upset, still caring things. It's like it happened to you yesterday. Let it go. You want a miracle? You want your mountain moved? Let it go. And speak to that difficult situation. Difficult situation of significance. Now the question is, can believe it God will do it 
it is true, God said it, that settles it. But now, but for some things to be settled, you got to put back in there, I believe it. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Because that's what Jesus just said. You can't doubt in your heart, but you got to believe that the things that you said are going to come to pass. Then you will have what you say. And then he says, believe that you receive it. Believe to the point that you've already received it. Believe that it's, that it's done. Now here's when you know that you believe like that. Can't nobody talk you out of it. So some of you, you're not there yet because we're trying to talk you into believing in the first place. You got to get to the point where they can't talk you out of it. Somehow, some way, somewhere, God is going to do this for me. Hallelujah! I used to preach this, and I'm still preaching it. We're preaching what we used to preach. Give God praises right now. 